Matt, welcome. Thank you. Normally I would say to the author, welcome to the desert, but Matt lives here, lives in La Quinta. So I, uh, um, I wanted to tell a little bit about you. American film director, done documentaries on Valentino, The Last Emperor, Citizen Zane, Battle for the City, Scotty and the Secret History of Hollywood, Studio 54, a four-part series on Showtime about the Reagans, and if that's not enough, he's editor-at-large and special correspondent for Vanity Fair. I, I'm not quite sure how you spend time in the desert ever. <laughs> <laughs> not a lot of time these days. <laughs> so I just want to jump right in. Sure. Why a documentary on Roy Cohn? Uh, I knew the basic story of Roy Cohn from really older relatives of mine who were haunted by him in the 1950s during the Army McCarthy hearing and the lore of this man. I'm Jewish, actually, and my relatives are sort of liberal Jewish people, and they really were bugged by a guy, Roy Cohn, who they felt had betrayed uh, the Jews, really, because he was a, they saw him as an arch villain, uh, a wrongdoer, and an immoral person. And he was a celebrity and an infamous figure. And he just haunted that generation of, of people who were kind of born in the 20s and 30s who were my relatives. So I had always heard about him. I'm a sort of student of that period. And uh, when Donald Trump won the presidency, I had known that Cohn was his mentor. And I thought, you know, this is a story that really needs to be looked into more. Because how was it? that someone who was infamous in the 1950s during the McCarthy period had had a profound influence and arguably had made a president from beyond the grave, which I think might be a first in history. And that was the premise of uh, setting off on the project of making the documentary. So I wrote the treatment uh, the day after Trump uh, won that election and I got the financing uh, in large part from uh, Norman Lear uh, who was the real angel for this. And he was like my, he was the same generation of those relatives who had said they were haunted by Roy Cohn. And when I met with Norman, he said, Roy Cohn has haunted me my entire life. Norman just died last month at 101, actually. Uh, so I have to thank him and Lynn Lear, his, his, uh, his wife. And how did you come up with the title? Did you have other thoughts about titles well, and you settled on this one? No, I actually thought of it, uh, well, the title is Where's My Roy Cohn? Uh, and I think this might be the first time a president has named a movie because uh, that's what Trump uh, blurted out the day that Jeff Sessions, who was his then attorney general to be replaced by Bill Barr, uh, wouldn't do his bidding, which is a perfect Roy Cohn scenario because the attorney general is, serves, of course, the republic, not the president personally as his attorney. And Sessions, whatever you think about him, uh, had dug his heels in and wouldn't do what Trump had commanded uh, as a personal uh, favor, I suppose. And he, <laughs> unbelievably, Trump blurted out, where's my Roy Cohn? And that gave me the title. And that's the perfect Roy Cohn scenario because Cohn was a, an attorney, uh, a member of the bar who uh, by turns, uh, I think, betrayed uh, all of the things that he had sworn to uphold. Uh, throughout his career and really, I think, reached new levels of, uh, of skullduggery and malfeasance, uh, at least up until that point um, in, our, in our society. So before we actually get to the documentary and talk about the particulars mm -hmm. of it, tell us a little bit about the research. What you, You've decided you want to do something on Roy Cohn. Right. What, what kind of research did you do to prepare for it? Well, I mean, there was a lot out there uh, and a lot that really hadn't been examined and visited for a long time because Cohn, who died of AIDS in the uh, kind of mid, early mid-80s, uh, really I think people had thought that the, the wooden stake had been driven through the heart and we wouldn't have to contend with him anymore except as a historical figure and even maybe a, a ultimately a footnote to history. But because of the Trump connection, uh, he kind of roars back as this figure who still haunts us because obviously we're in the middle of a presidential uh, rematch this year. Uh, we went to the video record and the film record. Uh, he was a figure who uh, kind of exploded into prominence in the early days of television. And he was a manipulator of the new medium, a master manipulator, I would say. 
so we got all of that early uh, Senate hearing material, Army McCarthy, uh, things from, uh, this is a little pre-TV, I think, but Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, because he was uh, a key player uh, in that prosecution. And in fact, it's said that he's the one who pushed for the electric chair for Ethel. Um, and this was really his first, I think, uh, kind of venture into a historical infamy. Uh, Army McCarthy came after that. And then, actually, that would have ruined anyone's career. It certainly ruined Senator McCarthy's career. He was censured and died not long after the Army McCarthy debacle. <coughs> but Cohn went to New York and reinvented himself as a kind of um, unique figure, a power broker, mob lawyer, society figure, and sort of rapscallion at large. And he was covered constantly by the press. Uh, he had befriended the powerful, the New York Times, which was in, all, in a way all powerful, even more so then. Uh, he had a lot of inroads into the Times. Uh, and the tabloid press and all the gossip columnists were taking dictation from him. Uh, basically. Which so how did you power. find all that information? Well, you go to the library, actually. Uh, <laughs> the, the, like the New York Public Library or the yeah. U.S. Archives? Yeah, or? no, that's a literal, but there, of course there, there are subtleties to it. Yes, the National Archives was a huge resource. If you're a filmmaker, the National Archives is a, a gift because it's free. And uh, part of the expense of making films, in fact, one of the biggest expenses of making a documentary film is the price of archival footage which the TV networks uh, sell at a, like a king's ransom, really. It's, it's actually a problem. And uh, you can get everything for free from the National Archive, and uh, we spent a lot of time there. I, I'm based in LA, and I do have a house here, uh, kind of like a weekend situation, but uh, we send people to DC, or we have people who are based in New York who go down. We, the New York library system, the New York Public Library is, I mean, I'm giving a tribute to libraries, and very appropriately so. Uh, the New York Public Library is a wonder, and they had collections. Uh, we went into other people's collections who, that were relevant, that were in the New York Public Library. Ken Aletta, who was a colleague of mine at Condé Nast when I was at Vanity Fair, had written an early profile of Cone for Esquire. Ken's actually in the movie as a kind of talking uh, head. He had spent time with Cone, and uh, Ken's tapes, his audio tapes of Cone, were housed at the New York Public Library, and they had just been digitized, and we were the first people to get into them, and he kindly donated them to us. So you hear Ken's interviews with Cone throughout the film, and it gives a kind of haunting film noir uh, feeling, and uh, no one had heard those tapes in 40 years, actually, and uh, so Ken becomes a character in the film on tape and in person as someone I interviewed. So it's, uh, this is really one of the, for me, as a journalist and investigative reporter, this is one of the great parts of this, the deep dive into the archive and amazing things you find. So one thing I did in the film was to recontextualize the Army McCarthy hearings for a modern, uh, a modern viewing of it, really. Army McCarthy, uh, it's, it's very complicated, I'll try to summarize it, but uh, Cohn was the whisperer. Well, wait, 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 oh. we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get All right, to that. Judge. I, uh, All right. <laughs> I've been, uh, he objects. Uh, I, I have to earn my money sustain. and do something. Sustain. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I want to go back to kind of the research because I think it's so interesting. Were there uh, interviews you didn't, that you tried to undertake and were not able to? Mm. With most of my films, that's the story, where you're chasing people. Uh, I'm doing a film on Sam Bankman Freed right now, and the FTX, uh, and I'm chasing all these people. As Sam Bankman Freed's in prison, he can't talk, and his, I want to speak to his parents, and they're being elusive. Uh, so I'd spent a lot of time doing that as a filmmaker. This one, it was so long ago. Uh, actually, I'll tell you one, Donald Trump. I, I did request an interview, and I actually thought there was a chance he would do it because he's such an attention freak, but uh, he did decline. And he was a sitting president. But everyone else, I think, pretty much fell in the line. There were a lot of people who um, had worked for Cohn, liked Cohn. They were junior attorneys in his, in his firm, and they spoke, and they were an interesting breed because they actually liked him, but they knew he had done wrong. So they were kind of schizophrenic. And I'd never really spoken or interviewed to people who were so divided, actually, because they really liked him personally. And then I'll, another thing uh, that's adjunct to this that I'll mention is 
um, that you know when you're when you're um, debriefing people like this, uh, it's very rare uh, to find people who actually have that kind of uh, schizophrenia over someone they knew. Usually, it's a kind of like up, up or down thumb. But this was really a kind of divided thing where they said that they knew that this guy was uh, someone who had uh, probably uh, sent someone to the electric chair on, uh, that was, uh, you know, absolutely a, a travesty, uh, that he was a mob abetter, an aider, and that he was a thief and a tax cheat, and they found him absolutely irresistible. And uh, I think you described him as charismatic and funny. Yeah, and that was I, actually uh, the unique situation for him because when I embarked upon the project, I actually was sort of queasy because I thought, how can I spend a year researching and then a, more months cutting a film uh, about someone so diabolical and distasteful? And that didn't turn out to be the case. He had this kind of dark charm and humor to him that I think was, in real life, his saving grace as well. And he was a tremendous gossip and traded in gossip in a kind of really, really uh, calculated way that made him powerful. And who does that remind you of, actually? Yeah, exactly. And that's where he learned it. So I have to tell you, I hadn't spent much time watching documentaries. And when Jamie asked me to interview Matt and interview him about this documentary. I, I probably watched it now 10 times, and I have the same reaction every single time. It's compelling, it's so interesting, it's so informative, it's so downright scary, and you have this schizophrenic reaction to it, and this, this it, each time it was an emotional feel when I watched it. So I recommend you watch it, it's on Amazon. If you have Amazon Prime, you can watch it. You can watch some of the other uh, documentaries there. But this one is really, really worth spending the time to watch it more than once um, because you, you catch things. It's like a book you know, or a movie sometimes. You have to watch it two or three times to get everything. You get so wrapped up in it. So what I wanted to do, rather than showing little clips of it, we're going to show the trailer. So if I could get uh, you to show the trailer, please. Testing one, two, three. Last question today. What makes Roy Cohn tick? Dora Cohn wanted a different son from the son that God gave her. And that imbued him a sense of shame about who he was. And his father gave him the language through law and politics to express his shame. Roy Cohn's contempt for people, his contempt for the law, was so evident on his face that you knew you were in the presence of evil. He was like a caged animal. If you opened the door, he would come out and get you. He's this ridge between the legitimate and the illegitimate world. When John Gotti walked into a bowl and shot a guy in the head, Roy managed to get Gotti off. We have Cohn investigating homosexuals very aggressively. But he was the one who threw the grid parties. And there were rumors he was picking up male prostitutes. He could pull strings and bring people together. He could pull strings and make people do things. I was in his office when Nancy Reagan called and thanked him for getting her husband elected. Cohn looked at Donald Trump as a protege. Donald had the money, and Roy had the balls and the shrewdness. Attack. Don't settle. Don't apologize. Attack. When you look at Cohn's life, you're shining a light on demagoguery, hypocrisy, and the darkest parts of the American psyche. According to Roy, Roy was responsible for everything important that happened in the United States. So, so I could probably end now, right? And you're going to run out and... and so I, I, before, again, we get to talking about Roy, uh, in my conversations with you, I was so fascinated about 
how you decide what the style of a documentary is and how you decided about this and then about the score and the music for this one. Right. Um, well, yeah, you do need to kind of have an idea in your head about what the style is. And then the movies are really made in the edit room. Uh, I mean, this feature films, they say, are made in the edit room, the scripted films, and I, I would agree with that. Documentaries even more so, I would say. Uh, it's akin to journalism, where it's a reportorial process, but then you really have to have something that's entertaining as well as journalistic. So I come up with a kind of idea of the style, and in this case, sometimes it changes in the course of, of the making. You see things that are different. You get the film in that you shoot. Would you shoot things in a certain style? This was, I'll give you the, the, the palette I had in my head, was film noir which was very much of the period when the Army McCarthy trials had happened. But tell us what uh, that means. Yeah, film noir is the, uh, the uh, style that emerged in the post-war period of a, um, a kind of uh, dark palette, a sort of film of, of the, the, the city streets at night, slick asphalt and uh, key, high, highly keyed lights and generally shot in black and white. So working with that film noir concept, uh, the Armand McCarthy footage and all of that Rosenberg footage and all of the early New York footage fit that. But, of course, I'm making a movie in uh, <coughs> the early part of the 21st century for an audience that doesn't particularly like watching black and white film, probably, so color noir was the idea. <laughs> and uh, I, there was an example of that that I had a personal connection to and I'm a fan of, actually, which is that wonderful Peter Falk series, Columbo, which was really based on film noir, and it was, I knew enough about it. It was shot by a, a, a director of photography at Universal, where they made it, named Russell Meddy, who was working with color film in the 70s, but he was the great film noir cinematographer, so it was a real film history thing there. And my father was one of the writers on Columbo, so I was kind of into this sort of personal idea. And we, we used the palette of Columbo, and we lit the interviews with that same color, which in that is a sort of like a caramely light. Uh, and that's, that was the look of it. And then we cut it like a film noir. We scored it like a film noir. And uh, it is a documentary film noir, I think. And he really is the great, one of the great film noir protagonists in real life, and then transmogrified into our, our kind of filmic memories and now another film, and that, that's the magic of film. Movies are magic, really, uh, because they invade your consciousness and they distort it, and that's, that's the fun of making them, actually. So Tell you put, us about the, the music. Style. Tell us about the music. The, the music, uh, the, the score, uh, the film, film music's made of two things. Uh, what's called needle drop, which are songs, and when, when you look at the sheet, uh, what the music supervisor gives you. It says known song, known title, and that means it's gonna cost you. Uh, and then you find you know, versions of it that don't break your budget, or you re-record it. And then the other part of it is score. And score is a composed uh, little symphony, really, that goes with your film, and it, it, it's very important because it kind of brings you up and it can bring you down. You heard a bit of the score in the trailer there. So I work with a composer who works with Hans Zimmer, who's the greatest film composer right now. And they have a whole setup in Santa Monica, and you go down, it's very glamorous. And you sit there in a room that looks like a Star Trek uh, spaceship, <laughs> and he composes, he can play an orchestra on his setup there. And he sits there and orchestrates it in front of you, and I say, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. I know nothing about music, but I, I know what I like. And then, after they do that, uh, they, uh, we hire a symphony orchestra, uh, and they actually play the score. And you can go to the symphony and see your film projected, and they'll play the film score, and they record it. Uh, however, to save money, we do that in uh, the Czech Republic, uh, where <laughs> musicians don't charge as much. And uh, either I fly to the Czech Republic, or I do it over Zoom. And uh, it's, it's great fun. So I want to begin at the beginning, and you ask a question right at the beginning about what makes Roy tick. And right. I think we need to probably start with his mother. Mm -hmm. Tell us about why she's important. 
Yeah, well, another influence for me on this were the films of Alfred Hitchcock, and, uh, which are psychological thrillers. And uh, usually Hitchcock, uh, probably nodding to Dr. Freud, uh, blamed everything on the mother uh, when he had a psychotic villain, uh, which may or may not be true in life. Uh, and I, I, think, uh, I think that Cohn was really a product of his mother, fascinating figure, Dora Marcus Cohn. Uh, who was the heiress to get, the, get this. So they were very wealthy. He was born into a wealthy Jewish family of not the highest caste, because the highest caste of wealthy Jews at that time were the German Jews of New York. The Loeb's are a good example of that. Our Crowd is what they called themselves. And there's a wonderful book by Stephen Birmingham called Our Crowd, which is the history of this group. There was a caste below that, which were the Eastern European Jews, which the German Jews looked down upon. Uh, severely, and uh, they were the highest caste of that second caste, and they were the Marcuses who, okay, this is what the Marcuses owned, uh, <coughs> Goldman Sachs, uh, Van Heusen shirts, which were huge at the time, uh, uh, Q-tips. Uh, someone in the family had invented the Q-tip, and uh, there was, so there was another fortune in there that I'm forgetting. I'll Lionel remember Trains, second. wasn't there? Lionel Trains, yeah. that was it, thank you, yeah. We had kind of a crazy uh, conglomeration of, of things. And it's a lot of money, and uh, Dora was, uh, if you know Yiddish, uh, a miskite. Uh, she was the, the miskite is the Yiddish, very unpolitically correct term for the kind of hopelessly ugly daughter of the family. And, no one would marry Dora, and things were getting desperate because it was, uh, she was getting up into her late 20s. At the time, this was an enormous tragedy to have an heiress unmarried in this type of family. And she eventually married uh, a young lawyer named Albert Cohn, who uh, the uh, Marcus family made a judge because he wasn't uh, high born enough to be married to Dora. So they got him made a judge, and then she was married to a judge. And, Roy's their only child. It's not how I became a judge. Uh, <laughs> so he says. Uh, the, uh, so the uh, only. Don't make a documentary, please. <laughs> I moved here for a reason. You know, little did you know. Uh, so Roy was the uh, only son, and um, Ro Dora was just, I guess, the mother from hell because she did things very early, even before he, you know, had. Uh, matured uh, that scarred him literally and uh, literally and metaphorically for life. Uh, one is that she didn't like his nose, uh, and she submitted him to a series of operations as a as a, a toddler to correct his uh, overly Jewish seeming nose, and it left him with um, a hideous scar that ran down the bridge of the nose this way. And that, I mean, if you want to get into novelistic. Uh, metaphor and symbolism, that was sort of like the original wound that he carried with him the rest of his life. And uh, Roy was a, a gay man and a very uh, into uh, aesthetic beauty and was not one himself. And I, you know, if you want to do some amateur psychology, you can kind of spin it out from there. That, that there was anger, there were mommy issues, there was a physical scarring, there was a frustration over uh, being different, Jewish and homosexual both very out groups at the time, uh, homosexuality being uh, probably the outest of the out uh, in many ways. And he wanted to be a quote unquote normal uh, and, and pretended to be quote unquote normal uh, his whole life and died, died of AIDS. I, this is the tragedy of Cohn where you could actually summon some sympathy. Died of AIDS, denying his sexuality until the very end, including in a, in a legendary interview with Mike Wallace on 60 we'll Minutes. Okay, objection. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I want, you know, there's so many things we could talk about, how brilliant he was. He graduates from law school at age 20. He f is fixing tickets for friends and fathers in of friends school. in high school. Yeah. Um, I mean, so he started all of this at an, an early age. But I, I, I want to, talk about, and we can talk about the, the Rosenbergs and all of that, but there was one part of it that, of course, was intriguing to me, and you somewhat mentioned it, and that is that he had, I mean, 
It was kind of orchestrated in some sense who the prosecutor was and who the judge was. And he had ex parte communication with the judge, right. if not throughout the trial, at least after, yeah. before the sentencing. Right. So this is the Rosenberg uh, uh, espionage trial. He was the junior lawyer. The government, uh, the Justice Department, which was very waspy, wanted a Jewish attorney uh, a team of Jewish attorneys to prosecute the Rosenberg so they couldn't be accused of anti-Semitism. And Cohen got on that through connections to his father. He was very young. He, he graduated from Columbia Law School, I think, in his teens. And uh, <clears throat> they put him on this. And he was the kind of attack dog. And I, I think his self-hatred also manifests through this because he's Jewish. And he's really gunning for the electric chair for the Rosenbergs, which was an extreme position even at that time. Especially for Ethel. Yeah, and Ethel arguably was just a kind of, at most, sort of uh, unwitting patsy in the scheme. She had typed a few documents at the, at the direction of her husband or her brother-in-law, or actually her brother, I think, David Greenglass. And anyway, uh, the ex parte communication happened uh, between Cohn and the judge in the case, who was a Jewish judge, who happened to be his next door neighbor in the fancy Park Avenue building, which was known as the Jewish building, uh, the very fancy upscale building. Uh, and uh, he called uh, Judge Sapol uh, very famously. Uh, during the deliberation period about the sentencing from the phone booth outside of Park Avenue Synagogue. Uh, this is like the most infamous thing ever to happen at Park Avenue Synagogue. And he told him to give Ethel the chair. And Judge Sapol, for some reason, listened. Uh, the people that knew him best said that Sapol was mesmerized by Cohn, that Cohn has a, had an almost mesmerizing, Rasputin-like, thing in his eyes, and he could seduce and mesmerize. And Sapol was- And you was, see that, you see that yeah. in the film, you see it. You do, he had these mesmerizing, kind of large, watery eyes. And uh, I, uh, where uh, some place I got archived for this was like, a guy I went to high school with actually turns out to be the chief rabbi of Park Avenue Synagogue. He was really into the project. And he was going through the archives and found me Roy's bar mitzvah program and, uh, all sorts of things like that. So we got some of that directly from the source. Uh, so, so we all know about the McCarthy hearings. But what was interesting to me, and I guess that I had forgotten, is that there were a second set of hearings, the McCarthy Army hearings. Right. So tell us, and I hope I pronounce this right, G. David Shine? D G. David Shine. A name <laughs> so, I didn't remember. Yeah, I mean, that was the thing. Like All these relatives of mine who told me about Cohen always would mention David Shine, and he was a real footnote to history. So I didn't really clock who Shine was. And that was, I think, the, the thing that time allowed, the revisitation of this allowed, was Shine was uh, a handsome Jewish heir to the Statler Hotel fortune, who was, today we would say, and the Daily Mail would report that he was Roy Cohn's boyfriend, or there'd be open discussion of this. But in the 50s context, open pub public homosexuality among important figures was not something that was ever discussed. It was unprintable. The word gay or homosexual was unprintable in the New York Times or even the tabloids. Really, it was relegated to <clears throat> you know, uh, confidential magazine scandal sheets is where you would find that stuff. And it was all very kind of um, <clears throat> predatory and and used to ruin people, smear people. It turned out, in my research, I found out that J. Edgar Hoover, who was a big promoter of Cohen's career, who was more than likely a closet homosexual himself, uh, used to leak to Confidential. He was one of the great sources of Confidential. So he would smear his enemies in Confidential, and Cohen would do the same thing. He used Walter Winchell and other gossip columnists of the day. But what Hoover and Cohen would do is they would drop the dime on other gay people who were living lives in the closet, and in exchange for protection uh, for their own secrets. That's, that type of thing would happen. And the Army McCarthy hearings are really a gay, if you can read them as this, and I think there's a lot of evidence to support it, as a gay psychodrama 
Uh, there were rumors, I know, I hope you're sitting down for this, that Senator McCarthy was also gay, uh, though married to his secretary, uh, and uh, the father of an adopted child that Cardinal Spellman had found for them very quickly when rumors were circulating that he was too long a bachelor. And um, McCarthy, with Cohn egging him on, was going after uh, you know, the supposed infiltration of the State Department and the Army with communists. And Cohn and he were getting very famous and very powerful and terrorizing people. Uh, this was the McCarthy period. It, he gave the name to the, that time of the uh, Cold War. At a certain point, McCarthy decided to go after Eisenhower, who was president, and the army. And this was going to be a bridge too far. Cohn was along for the ride and really kind of orchestrating the whole thing. Um, and uh, as they were starting to kind of persecute uh, branches of the army, people on army bases, Eisenhower had said to his guys, like, you have to put this to a stop. Um, but at the same time, it's a little complicated, Cohn and his probably boyfriend, at least love interest, David Shine, were investigating uh, lots of uh, things at bases like um, communist infiltrations within the communications departments of Fort Monmouth and things like that. And uh, they decided to... Um, uh, go after the army, and Cohen at the same time was doing special favors for Shine, and this is what the whole thing turned on. He decided that Shine, who was about to be drafted for the Korean War, should not be a private, but should be, and I kid you not, a general. <laughs> so he had threatened the army with, he had threatened certain uh, figures in the army with exposure as being spies or whatever, homosexual, whatever he made up if they didn't make Shine a general and post him in the penthouse of the Waldorf Astoria. <laughs> and, and you're really not making this up. I'm not. This is, in, in the documentary, yeah. <laughs> they specifically ask questions right. about that. And what I thought was interesting, too, just as a sidelight, there are all kinds of insinuations in those questions right. about homosexual right. relationships. So this is what I found when looking at the footage. Now, you can see lots of this footage in lots of other documentaries, but it's usually played as a sort of political drama where Bad McCarthy is overplaying his hand and Roy Cohn's whispering to him, and this was, these were the bad old days. But if you look at it, it's very literally a, uh, a kind of passion play about undoing these suspicious, smarmy people who probably are degenerates. And that's Cohn, Shine, and by extension, McCarthy. And there's a very famous um, moment where um, the uh, attorney uh, Welch, who's the person who is a, he's a great American hero, and he, he's the one who brings down McCarthy with a, a single sentence. Uh, Senator, you've done enough. Have you so? Have you no sense of decency, sir? At long last, have you no sense of decency? These, this one sentence uttered on national television was really the the straw that that broke it all for McCarthy. But before that, on the day before, the same day, the same Welsh, who's so magnificent, uh, is gay baiting Cohn and Shine uh, for strategic advantage to try to show that. This, there's something suspicious underlying this, that Cohen is acting in a, in a corrupt way, which he indeed was, but homophobia, what we would consider today glaring homophobia, uh, creeps into it. And there's um, one instance where uh, a photo is introduced into evidence, and uh, no one can say where the photo comes from, and uh, uh, Welch says, uh, well, what, did, did a fairy? Um, you know, produced this photo. And uh, McCarthy then says, uh, Counselor, uh, could I trouble you please to define uh, what, uh, oh no, sorry, did a pixie, I got it backwards. I ruined the punchline, but you'll get it anyway. <laughs> uh, did a pixie, did it come from a pixie? And then McCarthy says, uh, would you mind, you know, describing or defining what a pixie is? And then Welch says, I believe a pixie is akin to a fairy. 
Uh, and that clearly, we read that today. But at the time, that was kind of like, what? But we knew something was very amiss here, and that was enough. And th that's Army McCarthy. But you see, uh, Cohen, Cohen, and this is, goes directly to Trump, Cohen realized that there was no such thing as bad publicity, that the more attention you got, the better. And ultimately, if you look at his whole career arc, that worked for him until he was the, the denouement. I know. And we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Coming, <laughs> but uh, I won't spoil it. But uh, he, this is, Trump took this lesson from him. And he, they overplayed their hand in Army McCarthy. And then in typical crafty Roy Cohen um, uh, fashion, McCarthy's the one that gets ruined. And, and Cohen has enough mojo and enough family contacts and is young enough to reinvent himself. And after this, he moves to New York, and that's chapter two of, of the Cohen and, story. And he does reinvent himself, and he does survive this, which is amazing in of itself. The friends he had, actors and artists, um, Car Cardinal Spellman, the, the politicians. But there were two that, that surprised me. Um, Barbara Walters. How did he have a relationship with Barbara Walters? Uh, well, it's actually, there was a very long relationship with Barbara Walters. Uh, they were very close, and they quote unquote dated. And uh, the Cohen had been kind of dating women for the tabloid cameras for decades. Uh, he and David Schein would go on double dates with attractive young women. I knew some who had dated them and gone to 21 Club, like Barbara Warner, the daughter of Jack Warner was, uh, went on a date with David Schein, and Roy Cohn was there. Uh, uh, and I'm going to forget your question in a second, but uh, I wanted to just take a little sidebar here. Like, I, as a gay guy, looking at this, thought, you know what? This is so sad for Cohn, because David Schein was a catch. He was tall, rich, and Jewish, which is, if Dora Cohn were a little more modern, she would have been so proud of her son Roy for actually getting this trophy husband <laughs> in today's world. But at that time, it was so verboten and such a, to use Yiddish, ashanda, that uh, it, it ruined his life. And so that's where you could find some sympathy for this person who was victimized by this powerful mother. Uh, what was the we, question? We were talking about Barbara Walters. <laughs> yeah, Barbara Walters. But, but, but yes. I, I also want to get to his, his relationship with the Reagans, which was yeah. I, I was shocking to me that I didn't know. Sure, about. I can do Barbara, then I'll do Nancy. Good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> take your pick. Uh, Barbara Walters' father was a nightclub owner who owned a club in New York called the Latin Quarter. Lou Walters. Uh, he was very famous and prominent, and. Uh, the club mysteriously burnt down at a time when Lou Walters needed some cash, and Cohn got him off. Uh, there was an investigation, and Cohn got, got him off. That's that. And so Barbara Walters, when people would say to her in polite society, Barbara, how could you possibly? She said, well, you know, I owe him because he really saved my father. Uh, and uh, jumping ahead, if I'm allowed to do it, uh, she, she stayed with him to the end and, in fact, stood up for him when he was being disbarred and, and wrote a letter to the, uh, to the bar committee. Um, it was, I think it was quite shameful. But she wasn't alone. There were many other prominent New Yorkers who really backed him. Uh, so Nancy Reagan uh, and he were uh, fast friends. I always found this ironic about Nancy Reagan and the Reagans who had such a terrible record on the HIV AIDS crisis that most of Nancy Reagan's day-to-day -day closest contacts were gay men. Uh, it's true. Uh, Jerry Zipkin, um, Merv Griffin, um, uh, Roy Cohn. And when Cohen uh, uh, contracted HIV, he appealed to the Reagans for help and uh, the Reagans got him into his program at the National Institutes of Health overseen by Dr. Fauci at the time. And uh, Cohn was treated there, uh, and it was part of a, a trial that very few people could get into. And, and you have pictures of him in, in the White House. Oh, sure, in, I mean, he- In the Oval Office. There's a line in the trailer where one of his law associates, Robert Cohn, uh, says that he was in Cohn, Roy Cohn's office uh, the day after the 1980 election when uh, Nancy Reagan called him to thank him, uh, Roy, for winning Ronnie the White House, because uh, now this will blow your mind. Uh, there was an uh, associate of Roy Cohn at the time named Roger Stone, 
uh, who I interviewed. What, and can, can, yeah. I, can we stop right there? Because yeah. how did you get Roger Stone to talk on tape? Because he plays a major role in this, and uh, he is very candid. I mean, he didn't yeah. hold back. I think Roy, I think Roger Stone and Donald Trump were proud of their Roy Cohn association. I think they viewed him as a father figure. I think their love for him is uh, unabashed and overt. And I think that Stone, Roger Stone, who was on under a lot of pressure at the time I interviewed him, uh, wanted to stand up for Cohn. And uh, he gave an amazing interview, actually, and was very candid. Uh, it was one of the better interviews I've ever done, uh, as distasteful as the subject of the interview was, in my opinion. But he, he gave a great interview. Uh, but uh, so Roger Stone, as an associate of Cohn, had done a black bag job in the New York primary, which uh, diffused the electorate because they bribed, I believe, a Liberal Party candidate to um, help Reagan uh, on the ballot. So if there was a liberal line on the ballot, it would kind of split the vote. And Carter did fared more poorly in the general election because of this confusion that Cohn and um, uh, Stone had, had done at the direction of Nancy Reagan, apparently. She was consulting on it. So this shows, I later did a series, a four-part series on the Reagans to show how powerful Nancy Reagan was behind the scenes. And this was a great example of that. So what finally brings him down, because he, through his life, is charged many times with significant criminal indictments. Yeah. Sometimes he defends himself. Sometimes he gets them dismissed. He has this philosophy, you never settle and you fight. But he's never convicted. But what finally brings him down is a disbarment. And, and I want you to talk a little bit about it, because what I thought was interesting is, is that he's, in essence, accused of defrauding his clients. That's right. And, and lying under oath. So, you know, not only is he doing things for his clients that probably are unscrupulous, at the same time, he's defrauding them, and that's what brings him down. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, he, there have been many disbarment uh, attempts or many kind of uh, accusations over the years. And uh, I didn't really know this, but attorneys who are licensed by the bar are really at the mercy of the bar. There's not a lot. You could sue them for malpractice, but he would always get out of these things. Because he had a very famous adage, which, which was, don't tell me about the law, just tell me who the judge is. Because he would go directly to the judge and have a ex parte communication, as he had done with Judge Sapol, and get, like, get people the chair. So this worked for him. And believe me, this is what Trump is thinking every second. Uh, and it works uh, frequently. So um, a new head of the New York State Bar named Marty London took this thankless job. Uh, no one wanted this job. And this was before computers. It's like right on the verge of computerization. He went in, he took over this dusty Dickensian office with files and stuck in drawers. Can you see why he's a good documentary? He puts such a great picture. I love yeah. it. <laughs> I just just talk them out. It would be cheaper. Uh, <laughs> so uh, he goes through his the file drawer, and he finds at the bottom the very thick Roy Cohn file. And London is a really sharp guy. Uh, he's still with us and writes a blog, and is, uh, he was wonderful in the film. And he says, ah. What's this? And he knew about this stuff. So he starts going through it, and he says, like, we're going to do this. We're going to actually pursue this. And I think he said that the underlings in the office were like, no, 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 no. Not a can of worms. We're not going to do that. He's like, no, we're going to do it. So he started to do it. They followed it through. They found enough. I guess they hauled Cohn before whatever tribunal you know, they, they have, whatever their process was. And they put the case together, and eventually, as he's dying of AIDS, which he referred to on 60 Minutes with Mike Wallace as liver cancer, um, he was disbarred, I think, weeks before um, his death. And uh, there was an irony. I couldn't really figure out how to get in the documentary, but the courtroom in which the tribunal met was the uh, Court of Appeals in Madison Square in Manhattan, and that was his father's courtroom. Uh -huh. 
And his father's name is in a mosaic in the rotunda, the kind of dome above it. So he was officially disbarred under the name Cohn in mosaic uh, above his head. So I, I want to quickly say, because we just have a little over a minute, that what I found really interesting, and you bring this out, is he talked about loyalty. He said, if you're loyal to your friends, your friends will be loyal to you, because they seem to have been when he was being disbarred. After he was disbarred, he had no friends. None of them were loyal to him. But I want, in one minute, I want you to end with the Mike Wallace interview, because it's probably the most compelling. Well, yeah, I mean, Wallace. And you've got 50 seconds. Thank you. Uh, uh, Wallace, who was a member of that upper cast of New York celebrity uh, who ran in the same circles as Cohn, got him to sit down for an interview. And Cohn is visibly uh, suffering from AIDS, denies he has it. Cohn says, people say Roy Cohn is a homosexual and is dying from AIDS. And Roy Cohn says, Mike, I'm not dying from nothing. I have liver cancer and I'm gonna beat this like I beat everything else in life. And uh, he died a few weeks later. That's the one thing he, he couldn't escape from, which is a terrible, sad irony. Great documentary, great person to do a documentary. Please watch it. Thank you, Matt. Thank you.